everybody, this is Tyler. I'm coming at you once again, gonna give you the lowdown on what's happening here at Canyon View. Fall marriage retreat's coming up November 5 to 7. That's coming up quick at the Wine Country Inn out in Palisade. You're going to want to sign up out at the group's desk. They have some great brochures that give you the lowdown on what's happening. We'd love for you to join us, but the cutoff date is October 1st, so get signed up real soon. Here at Candy View, we love to partner with missionaries across the world. This weekend, we have Carl and Jolynn Kraus. They're going to be out in the lobby. You can meet them there. Or between services on Sunday, you can go to T107. See a short video, have some coffee and pastries, get to know them better. All the details are in the bulletin. We'd love to see you there. Hey students, next weekend, we've got to remind you that it's move up weekend. So if you're in seventh grade, you're going to be moving up to momentum. If you're in ninth grade, you're going to move up to extreme living. So don't forget. Hey, last but not least, I want to remind you that Gateway is happening Sunday right after service. It's going to be in the Fellowship Hall. If you want to find out the vision and where we're going and what we're about here at Canyon View, you need to attend that. Hey, that's about it for this week. If you got more questions, obviously you got that bulletin full of information. You can go out to the lobby and check out some people out there behind those desks. They'd love to give you more information. And last but not least, go to our website, canyonviewchurch.com. Pull them into the center. You know, we got to have that big track going around like that. So we and, got room. And then the disco ball, like right there. Oh, yeah. Okay. Hey, what, what are you guys doing? Oh, hey, the, the local ro roller derby team, they want to practice in here on Friday nights. What? You can't do that in a church. Just the building. Oh, great. So what, what will be next? Secular music? This type of stuff won't even fly in this church, mister. What's next? Church poker night? Sitting out on top of the world. Uh -huh. Come on, have a sense of humor. Speaking of sense of humor, I got to read this to you. This Steve Sanford brought this home from Loveland. This is about the church of the Holy Sacrament. Some of you may love this church. Since last month, Larry Hill traded in his medical marijuana dispensary in Logmont to start a cannabis church in Berthet. If you don't know what cannabis is, go home and look it up. Hill, who opened the apothecary on Kaufman Street in February 2009, turned the business over to family members to focus on the Church of the Holy Sacrament, a non-denominational cannabis ministry he founded in July. Members gather for a short sermon, and many, many here would probably say amen to that, usually less than half an hour, and before smoking what Hill calls the sacrament. We use cannabis as a sacrament the same way as the Catholic Church uses wine, said Hill. Hill points to several biblical mentions of a cannabis as an ingredient of holy anointed oil. He and other spiritual marijuana advocates say the herb God gave humankind in Genesis was a reference to marijuana. Lord, we ask your blessing on this sacrament and everyone who partakes, and we ask that you will heal the mind, body, and spirit. Amen. He'll pray over a colorful double bubble bong <laughs> on the kitchen counter, which held about a gram of atomic Northern Lights marijuana that Hill said a church member had donated. Boy, they're it's getting creative of the type of marijuana these days, and then he'll lit the bowl, inhaled, and passed the bong to his assistant pastor, Jeremiah Peterson. He says, it brings me closer to my brothers and sisters, said Peterson. I'm calmer. My prayers are more in-depth. They're more spiritual. Spiritual. 
So pass the bong. I just felt that this was really uh, kind of amusing, and it's, it kind of brings to light that there are certain things that we can go over the edge with that we say that this is being religious, right? But I, I think that kind of brings home the reality that there are other things that others may seem to think as being actually pretty silly, that others think that this is sacred. We have to have this in the church because the church is supposed to have this, and we can fill in the blanks whatever this is. But the re reality is many of us don't understand even where this came from. But we were raised in a certain belief or in a certain stream, a denomination of a church, and that church prescribes this as being sacred, and so we've kind of grown up and embraced that. And, and we kind of advocate that this needs to be in the church. And, you know, you guys can all fill in what this is. As we showed in the video, just kind of showing the, the kind of how ridiculous it would be to have a roller derby practicing in our sanctuary. By the way, there is a local roller derby team, and they did call us to see if we had a gymnasium they could practice with. I find that kind of humorous. And uh, I look forward to go to the first game. But if you, if you go to Europe, I had some friends who went to Europe. And, you know, what do you do in Europe is, is you tour around and you look at all of the cathedrals. And just these great, massive, unbelievable uh, architectural structures and very artistic and, and ornate. And the thing that people kept saying with, that have been to Europe and if you've been to Europe, you know what I'm talking about. You can go into these cathedrals, but there's something that's missing. What's missing? The people. There's no one there. And so you have this great cathedral, no people in it. Is it still a church? The question that I want to throw out for many of us is, what really is truly sacred? What are things that we are going to be willing to die on a hill for? And what are things that maybe we have kind of split hairs over that really aren't that sacred in God's eyes, but maybe to us they are, and maybe it would be a challenge to us that this is something that we just kind of need to lay down. You know what I mean? For instance, in this church, as you would notice, you come in, and some of you, maybe you're new here, you look around, and it, if this is a Christian church, how come there's no cross? That many people have complained and written to us, like, how come your church doesn't have a cross? Now, I wasn't involved in the construction of the building, but um, in the beginning, my understanding is, is that Canyon View wants to be a church for the unchurched. And so one of the things that they felt would be a more a deterrent than something that would welcome and invite anyone into this building is a cross. It's kind of like this little boy, he goes into the church for the very first time, and he walks into the lobby, and there's a big crucifix, a big cross with Jesus hanging on the cross. This kid had never been in a church before, had never seen that before, and he looks up, and he goes, what's that? And one of the ushers there said, well, that's a crucifix, that's Jesus on the cross. And the boy starts crying, and they're thinking, oh, how sweet. This young boy, he's really having compassion for Jesus who, who died for our sins. And they asked him, well, well, Johnny, what are you crying about? And he said, if I go in there, are they going to do that to me? You see, there is so many different things about religion that many people don't have any language for. They just don't have a grid for it. And so we want to be a church that is truly authentic, that, that people are, are truly following Jesus and doing the things that Jesus called us to do. But the question is, what does that look like? Now, we do endorse the power of the cross. Like 1 Corinthians 1.17, Paul said, For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with words of human wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. So we do believe that there is power 
in the cross. That through the cross and the act of Jesus, given his life, who he who is sinless became sin on our behalf. That him being the son of God, that he freely gave his life on the cross so that our sins can be forgiven for those who have faith in his atoning work. So we do believe that the cross is paramount. It's important. We use the three crosses in our Easter service. We use many slides that have crosses on them. It, it is something that we believe is in the heart of the gospel. But I have not found a scripture, and maybe someone would find it for me if it's there, where it says, thou shall have a cross on your church building. I just don't see it. Some of the other things that we may kind of subscribe to as something that is sacred is many of you may have grown up in a church that men are supposed to wear a suit and tie. And it's, it's out of reverence that out of respect you want to look re reverent to God, right? Um, maybe, maybe you've been in a movement that says that women are to wear long dresses and not wear pants. Thankfully, Laura, my uh, executive assistant, I had wrote in my notes that women are not to wear pants. And she said, you might want to rephrase that. <laughs> Some believe that men aren't supposed to have long hair, that women are supposed to wear a covering over their head. Others prescribe that you're supposed to wear a Hawaiian shirt to truly be spiritual. I don't know what that is. But as we go through Acts 21, what you will see here is that what happened back then is the same thing that happens today. That we go to war over the silliest things. We go to war over things that are just rumors, that aren't really facts. And so it's really important that we grab hold of what's really the heart of God. What is really important to God, is it follow, following these religious rules and laws, or is it being people that are living like Jesus? And so, let's look at this in Acts 21. We're starting at verse 17. And I want us to kind of get a, a sense as we read this of seeing how religion has become so embedded in the hearts of the Jews that it actually drove them to actually try to kill one of their own. In verse 17, Paul sa or Luke says, When we arrived at Jerusalem, the brothers received us warmly. Now, these would be the uh, believers in Jesus. That's, these are the brothers he's talking about. The next day, Paul and the rest of us went to see James, and all the elders were present. Paul greeted them and reported in detail what God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. This is the common practice when Paul would come back. This is his third journey. He would tell the elders, man, you won't believe the things I've seen God do to the Gentiles, to the non-Jews. And they were celebrating this. It says, when they heard this, they praised God. Then they said to Paul, you see, brother, how many thousands of Jews have believed, and all of them are zealous for the law. Now, what they're basically doing with Paul now is say, hey, Paul, there's an issue going on here. There's some rumors going around about you, bro. And so we're just kind of warning you, and we want you to do something here. And it says, they have been informed that you teach all the Jews who live among the Gentiles to turn away from Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children and live according to the customs. This isn't what Paul was teaching, but this is what word was getting around. And this happens so often in the church, doesn't it? That there is a rumor that gets started, and it just spreads like a brush fire. Did you hear what they're teaching at the vineyard? And then it says, what shall we do? They will certainly hear that you've come, so do what we tell you. And this is very interesting. It says, there are four men with us who have made a vow. This is, called, this is a, believed to be a Nazarite vow. And this Nazarite vow is what would happen is if you were in the presence of a Gentile, a non-Jew, you become unclean in their eyes. And so this Nazarite vow is you go through this cleansing ritual, you shave your head. I think Ronnie and Lane, our bass player, Ronnie, our, our worship leader, are 
having this long-term Nazarite vow as they've shaved their heads. But here's what they tell them to do. Take these men, join in their purification rites, and pay their expenses so that they can have their heads shaved. Then everybody will know there is no truth in these reports about you, but that you yourself are living in obedience to the law. And so they're saying, hey, Paul, for the sake of our brothers here, go through this Nazarite ritual, this purification ritual. Go and pay for these four guys. Show the Jewish brothers that you are still following the law, the Mosaic law. And said, as for the Gentile believers, we have written to them our decision that they should abstain from food, sacrifice to idols, from blood, from the meat of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. And this comes from Acts 18 and that we talked about a few weeks ago. And so uh, what they're clarifying here is Paul never said to the Jews to not follow the law of Moses. What he did tell, which was a letter that was sent from the elders, was they sent a letter to the new Gentile Greek believers that you don't have to become circumcised, but you'll do well to not eat food that has been sacrificed to idols, and you'll do well to not practice any of the sexually immoral practices that were common in the pagan temples there. And so this is what was happening. That's the truth. But rumor got around that Paul was saying for the Jews to not have to get circumcised and they don't have to follow the Mosaic law. It simply wasn't the truth. And so the Jews that were there, what they're basically doing is they're trying to protect their law. They're trying to protect what they've been raised with is, is the, uh, the Torah, the first four books of the Bible of Genesis through Deuteronomy is follow that law because this is what they were raised with and this is what they strongly believe in and they were doing whatever it took to protect it. And so as we look at that, as we would kind of turn it to ourselves, is, is what are the things that we are still holding on to that is sacred, that maybe isn't truly spiritual? What, what are the things that we feel that the church should be doing that really is just your culture, or maybe it's the way you were raised that there's certain types of music that you like and that you think is more spiritual, maybe has more uh, anointed language in it, and so you think the church should sing that. There's so many different things that people will come into a church, and we all have certain agendas with us, don't we? And the thing that I think is so important for us to do is to really take it to God and say, God, is this really what you want? Is this of you? You know, I, it's interesting. I went to, I've been going to this uh, Japanese restaurant. I don't know why I go to a Japanese restaurant, but there's something about that kind of lures me to it. But as, as I've gone there, I've gotten to know the owner of the restaurant. And she told me that, um, there's been some people from this church that have frequented there and have asked her if she knew me. And they, she says, well, I don't know who that guy is. And they said, well, he's a short Asian guy that always wears Hawaiian shirts. And she goes, oh, yeah, I know him. And they said, did you know he's the pastor of our church? And she goes, no, I didn't know that. They said, you should come to our church. And so I've been coming there and she's been talking to me about this. She'd never been to church before. She was raised Buddhist. She's been to the Buddhist temple, but she had never been to a Christian church. And so just this last week, I was talking to her. She said, you know, I'm really nervous to come, but my kids really want to go. And so she goes, what's the first thing she asked? What should I wear? And so I said, wear what you're wearing now. She had on some slacks and a T-shirt. She goes, I can come like this? I said, well, I come like this. <laughs> she goes, really? I go, yeah. And I said, in fact, call me. If you come, I'll meet you at the door. I'll show you where the kids go. You can sit in the very back, and you have no obligations to anything. She goes, really? I go, yeah. And it blew her away that we would be that welcoming and inviting to her because she 
is Buddhist. But her kids want to come here. Now, I think a church that is being the church welcomes anyone into their doors, no matter what they look like, no matter what socioeconomic class they come from, no matter what color of their skin is. I find it kind of humorous. I kind of find this humorous because uh, I've often said to the Lord, why don't you send me to Hawaii where there's a bunch of Asians? I'll suffer for you there. <laughs> but isn't it kind of funny that here we are in Grand Junction, a, a white, middle-class community, and you have a Hispanic worship leader with a shaved head and a Fu Manchu and a little Asian pastor. <laughs> what is up with that? I think that's something that's God's humor, but I think it's also maybe, possibly, God's strategy of breaking down socioeconomic racial barriers so that we can truly become a desegregated church. Wouldn't that be great? Because the church is the most segregated place on the planet every weekend. That people will go to another church that has people that are just like them. Because you go to church by choice. So you go to a church where you feel comfortable, right? Would you feel comfortable if people that were street people continued to come here? Would you feel comfortable if people that are struggling with addictions came here? Would you be comfortable if people in a lower socioeconomic class came here? I hope you're saying yes. Because that's the church. That's not the church we want to be. I believe that's the church. And when the church is doing that, then I believe the Holy Spirit smiles on it and the Holy Spirit moves. Now, the, the one thing that I... I see in this scripture here what's going on here is there's this issue between the letter of the law and the spirit of the law. Paul had it, that he understood the spirit of the law. And there are many of us that have been raised in movements that really embrace the letter of the law. And what I mean by that is, is let's just take, for instance, this issue of drinking alcohol. This, this has been a great debate in the evangelical church. And so we look at a verse like Ephesians 5.18, do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Of course, it's very clear that, that when we are drunk on wine, we lose our faculties, we lose our ability to be responsible, and the Holy Spirit is not in control of our life. The alcohol is in control. And so we, I do affirm that it is wrong for us to get drunk, Right? But this, do we take the letter of the law and then say, so don't ever drink alcohol. And if you drink any alcohol, we will disassociate with you that you are not a brother or sister in Christ anymore. That's how some people will take it to, to that nth degree. But I think the spirit of the law is actually harder to follow. Because the spirit of the law is thinking about what is better for your brother in these laws. For instance, is it okay to drink as long as you don't get drunk? The scripture does say just don't get drunk on wine. It doesn't say don't drink. In fact, Paul says to Timothy, in Timothy, drink a little wine for your stomach for medicinal purposes. It doesn't say smoke a little marijuana for medicinal purposes. Okay? But it does talk a lot about, Scripture talks a lot about not being tempted. So if you are an alcoholic and you are in recovery and you know that if you start drinking, you can't stop. And so Matthew 6, 13, Jesus taught us how to pray and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Sometimes we don't need deliverance from the enemy. We need deliverance from ourselves. That we're the ones that put ourselves into tempting situations, right? And so if you're an alcoholic, definitely don't drink. 
It's stupid for you to drink if you're an alcoholic because it's going to start you on that road of falling off the wagon where it's going to become destructive in your life. What follows with this is this whole issue of causing a weaker brother to stumble. Paul talked about this in Romans 14, 20. He says, do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All, clean is, all food is clean, but it is wrong for a man to eat anything that causes someone else to stumble. It is better not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything else that would cause your brother to fall. So following the spirit of the law, it's important for us that we be sensitive of our environment, not that we're being hypocritical, but that out of love for another person, that if you have people over to your house for dinner and you know one of them is in recovery from alcohol, it would be the loving thing to do to not have any beer or wine there when you're having dinner. Because out of, uh, out of the sake of respecting and loving your brother who is struggling in their recovery. Do you understand what I'm saying? But we could say, well, we follow the, the spirit of the law and it says that we can drink as long as we don't get drunk. But how do you know what it's doing into the heart of a brother that is struggling deeply with that issue? That's following the spirit of the law. Because what Paul talks about, the, the reason that the law is given is to show us how far we are from God. In Galatians 5.1, Paul said, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. What did he set us free from? It says, stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. That slavery is slavery to the law. Because what the law prescribes to us is that we have to cross every T and dot every I of the Mosaic law. And if we have one, just one minor infraction, then we are sinners. And we have fallen away from God. And we are eternally separated from God because of sin. And so that's a burden that is put on, was put on the Jews that you have to follow the law knowing that they couldn't follow it. Isn't that crazy? You have to do this. That's what the Pharisees prescribed to people. You have to follow all these laws. They couldn't even follow them. That's how crazy it was. And so Christ came to set us free from the burden of the law by what he did for us on the cross. And God wants us to live in the freedom of his grace, not in the being encumbered by the yoke of the law. But that's what happens when we get stuck in the, the law instead of the spirit of the law. Now, I, I really believe that in the spirit of the law, the truths about God's law that you see in the Torah, the first four books of the Bible, I think they actually are prescribed to us to make our life better. Do you know that? If you would follow the law the way it's prescribed out of grace, because we know that if I do these things, my life will go better. And so, for instance, it says not to covet thy neighbor, right? So if I see my neighbor's truck, and I see my neighbor's snowmobiles, and I see my neighbor's boat, and I see my neighbor's Harley. I have a rich neighbor. <laughs> and I covet those things. What happens to me? I get filled with greed. And when I allow greed to take over my heart, I can even become deceptive, and I can lie, and I can even break laws to obtain more so I can have more of what my neighbor has. That's what happens when I just start to covet what my neighbor has. You understand what I'm saying? It's the same thing with honor the Sabbath, where God says honor the Sabbath. It's interesting. I have a friend in Canyon, that, Canyon City that he had a construction business, and when business was, was really busy for him, <laughs> he, he worked seven days a week. He said, I had to. I would do work on houses for six days, and on the seventh day, which was Sunday, I'd go to church, I'd come home, and I'd have to do all my books. And what he began to realize was, was this was starting to take a toll on him. And so he made a commitment to God, because I 
think I remember I preached one day on honoring the Sabbath. And he was convicted.